So I'm Steve Patrick. I have the great privilege of being executive director of the Forum for Community Solutions at the Aspen Institute. It's great to see a whole bunch of familiar faces. It's really nice to see a bunch of fresh faces in the room. Uh, and we welcome you all to this, uh, this biannual convening of the Forum and of the Opportunity Youth Funding Forum. Um, let me start by also just acknowledging and appreciating the native peoples uh, who are sharing this land with us, uh, who came here long, long before the Amazon tribe or uh, any of the other tribes that are here now. So, uh, you know, I want to just recognize the Suquamish, the Duwamish, the Nisqually, and the Snoqualmie peoples whose land we're visiting and bussing around. And I uh, always want to acknowledge those who have been here for thousands of years prior to the arrival of, of all of us or many of us. Um, and, uh, and let me also acknowledge that Melody is not with us, Melody Barnes. Uh, she's here in spirit. This is the first of, I think, these 13 gatherings that uh, Mel has not been able to make it to. We're actually, uh, Lily Allen knows this, we're making up t-shirts for the next convening that say, Got Mel. Uh, um, and she sends her love, uh, and she will be with us in Aspen October 8th to 10th. Um, but couldn't be here this time. And then maybe even more importantly, let me just acknowledge that Monique Miles is not with us today. Uh, and probably a number of you have heard this was not planned, um, but Monique's mom passed last week. Um, and, you know, let's just take a moment uh, just to acknowledge uh, Monique, send her your thoughts, a moment of silence to recognize the passing of her mother and a moment of silence just for each of you to reflect on those who aren't with us right now um, in your own way. That was the perfect way to break the silence. <laughs> that was perfect, uh, except we need three more chords. Um, so, um, so that's awesome. Uh, I think Monique will appreciate hearing from all of you and, and, um, and she sends her deep love and, and warm regards. Um, let me do a couple quick thank yous because of course that Monique would be doing that uh, were she here. First, uh, the, the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions team, uh, staff and fellows, can you guys just stand up so we can acknowledge you all for your hard work in, in this. Aspen Conference Services, the rock stars who make all this happen, thank you Aspen Conference Services for pulling this off. Uh, we won't embarrass her again, but to Nicole Yohalem and everybody from the King County world uh, who have been working on this tirelessly to help host this, thank you all, CCER and, and everybody. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to the young leaders who helped pull this together. So apologies if I, if I get any names wrong, but Frida Crichton, Tori Felder, Tevin Gladney, and Michaela Wright. Where are you all? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your leadership and uh, creativity and vision in helping to pull this together. It's, it's awesome to have youth at the center of it leading it. And I know you took over, some of you have taken over our Instagram feed. Um, and I, I, we're trying to get more people to check that out. So check out the Instagram feed coming from the youth of South King County. Um, so let me just, just frame this up real quick and then let's get to the, get to the plenary because I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, conversation. Um, you know, it's now been about five years since we've started pulling this network together, five years plus since we've started to use the language of opportunity youth around the country. Um, it's really been remarkable to see the attention that a population historically in this country has been literally left out of uh, the conversation and not uh, receiving the attention necessary to solve the challenge of belonging. Uh, 
to, to bridge those young people to opportunity. Um, and it's been uh, a powerful experience for all of us, I think, to come together. I mean, a lot of you vote with your feet, so you're still coming. That's a sign that there's some value to this gathering. And I'd say we're making progress. And a lot of you, you know, equal measure, our third party evaluation partners are in the room and, and this third year evaluation of the work is pretty compelling. Uh, lots of success, lots of systems change happening in places, lots more to do. And I think that's sort of the frame for this gathering and for the work ahead. We're, we're really ready to go 2.0. We, we're welcoming other communities into this network um, and there are a few things we're doubling down on. One is trying to solve for the inequity in our equity work. Uh, sorry for using equity twice in one sentence, given how much of a buzzword it's become. But, but as we launch this network, you know, we started from the beginning, including rural and tribal communities, but we didn't have the resources to include the numbers we would like. So in the years ahead, we intend to very intentionally engage other communities from parts of America that are so often flown over and forgotten, and young people who really have some of the least access to opportunity in our country. We also emphasize data from the beginning, but it's really time in the year ahead for all of us to get real serious about data and quality and rigor and impact across the pathways that you're all working on. In a lot of the communities, you're carrying this tension of pilots that really connect young people and figuring out which pathways to scale. Are they, are they in the post-secondary system? Are they focused on child welfare involved young people? Are they workforce system connected? Um, and I guess the message from all of us at Aspen is uh, stay focused and let's all figure out how to be smart together to move faster on the pathways that work in our communities and then leveraging the public revenue streams for those folks. So that's gonna be a big focus in the year ahead. Really, how do we collectively define success? What are the metrics we're gonna hold ourselves as a network accountable to? Um, and how are we gonna get to the 2.0 of dramatically reducing the number of youth and young adults who are not connected to, to careers and to, to learning opportunities? Um, and then, you know, we, we uh, announced at the last meeting, I think I uh, prematurely and probably immaturely, uh, if you all know me, uh, announced the Ford grant, uh, uh, Ford Foundation Build Grant that's supporting our work and the work of Opportunity Youth United. Man, come on, it must be early in the morning. If I, if I can say Opportunity Youth United and there's not a shout out from Jamil, then somebody, somebody's sleeping. Uh, and really what we're gonna do in the years ahead is double down on the youth engagement piece of this work. Um, and that comes directly from this network. I mean, you all have really walked the talk of nothing about us without us. You've helped put young people authentically in these conversations, helping to define the work versus tokenizing. And we see a real opportunity to double down on youth organizing and youth led change in the years ahead. So that is gonna be core to what comes next for us, all of those things. Um, and then um, there's more to do. So, uh, you know, we are leverageaholics. Um, and over the next several days, you'll hear more about focusing on youth entrepreneurship. You'll hear more about these opportunities for defining quality and rigor. Um, and, you know, this is still a sort of hashtag not normal moment for all of us who care about the young people in our country. And you know, we, we know that we have a responsibility to do more for those who feel like they are freshly targeted, retargeted uh, for some of the systems that we're trying real hard to keep young people out of and to reform. And so thinking through what it means to take a stand on justice reform what it means to really stem the school to prison pipeline, what it means to stand in solidarity with the young people who uh, may not have documentation but sure deserve a shot at the American dream 
and at an education and at a family sustaining job. Um, those are all things we're thinking hard about and want to be supportive of you all. Uh, as, as we've heard from so many of our young people that they feel especially vulnerable right now um, and frankly somewhat afraid. Um, and so there's a moment here of intense othering. I'm just teeing John up here as much as I possibly can. Um, and, and I think we, we have to uh, be responsive to that um, in this moment. And so that's the 2.0 for us as well, um, is to, to think through how we work together to support the, the young, youth and young adults who feel most vulnerable at this time and who authentically could well be most vulnerable at this time in our country. So that's the frame. Um, there's a through line from all our work, and so I just want to close the framing remarks with the through line and then use the through line to get to John Powell, which I know all of you are like, Steve, let's get to John Powell, please. Um, so you'll recall uh, the first time we ever gathered, we talked about racial equity in the first plenary we did, structural and institutional racism. And we were very clear that we were not going to use euphemistic language. We were not going to do what a lot of uh, national initiatives do, which is sort of use income as a proxy. Um, and, and that thread has stayed with us, you know, from that first framing conversation to um, Angela Glover Blackwell addressing this group the following year and really helping us put a deeper stake in the ground around uh, racial justice and racial equity. Uh, it, the through line follows with so many of the other folks who have joined us over the years for this learning experience. Um, you'll recall when Melody interviewed uh, David Domenici and, and his partner uh, James who started Maya Angelou Charter Schools way back when about their own work on justice reform. Uh, it's a through line that Manuel Pastor hit on at another plenary in one of these gatherings. It's a through line that will always be a part of this network for as long as we convene. Um, and I think it's a especially important moment in our gathering as a group to double down on that challenge for all the reasons I mentioned earlier in terms of framing the future of our work together and the focus. And so there it really is no better thought leader, uh, no one we could think of in this moment to invite to kind of kick off the convening uh, than John Powell. Uh, I encourage you, I'm not gonna do bios for all of our panelists today. They, are, they have really beautiful photos, much nicer than mine, in the, in the back of uh, the book. And there, there's deep history for all of our youthful but his, history experienced panelists. Um, and a lot of you know John from his books, from his speaking, from his time running the Kieran Institute, um, and, uh, and a lot of you are familiar with his work. All of you now have his book. How many of you started it last night? Uh, it's, it's, that's good. 17 people out of 400 is not bad, John. It's a, after this, I think there will be more. Um, and, you know, John is currently the director of the Haas Institute for Fair and, and Inclusive Society at UC Berkeley. Um, and he's also been a part of a whole bunch of work later um, at this convening tomorrow, actually. Nisha Patel will be talking about some of the pathway work she's been doing, uh, helping to lead a, a serious panel that the Gates Foundation put together addressing poverty. Um, and John was instrumental in that work, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that during the, the panel. Um, but recognizing the through line around the work of racial justice with this network, recognizing the moment we're in, um, we couldn't be more excited to, to touch base with John Powell and to have him kick off our, our first plenary of this gathering. And so without further ado, I invite John Powell to join us and, um, and begin the conversation. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. 
Um, so I think what I'm going to do is have you maybe just take a break and have you go read my book, and then we'll come back. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, many friends. I, my son was born here in, in Seattle, actually, and I lived here for many years. Um, very close to something called the Four Amigos. For those of you who are from Seattle, you may know about them. Uh, so Seattle, I feel like I sort of cut my wisdom teeth here. So this morning, I'm here to talk to you mainly about um, a particular aspect of my work, which is called targeted universalism. And uh, Steve already talked about 2.0. Some of you talked about equity 2.0 and opportunity. Um, and it's a way to both do the work and a way, a way of talking about the work that actually does some other things in addition to what is the goal. So one of the other things it does is bridge, which I'll talk about as well. So targeting universalism, othering, and a little, just a little bit of mind science. Those are the three things I'm going to try to cover in about 25 minutes. So you may be wondering, what is othering? So here's a cartoon to help you out. Stop othering me. What's othering? Your kind will never understand. Um, and so one way I think about othering is that othering is about denying someone their full humanity. And it's not just a interpersonal process. It's also the way we organize structures, the way we organize cultures, uh, the way we organize our physical space. Um, and so in a sense, this is a problem that's actually very pronounced, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And so, so it's not surprising that one of the main themes in our country right now is the issues of walls and who belongs. Um, and so the opposite of othering is not saming. So you don't address othering by simply saying, well, we're all the same. And especially when it comes to the context of race, that's one of the uh, moves that we oftentimes make. Like, actually, I never see race. I don't notice race. We're all the same. Why are we talking about race anyway? Um, in fact, many people have told me over the years, you know, John, I, you know, when I see you, I don't even notice that you're black. You know, it's like, really? <laughs> I certainly notice that you're white. But anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea of, of again, dressing other is not to say let's uh, figuratively and, and literally bleach out all of our differences. Uh, so we're really talking about something else. We're talking about belonging. And belonging actually uh, both holds our differences, but also holds our connections. So it's interrelated. And here's sort of three um, slides that just capture this. It's like one is exclusion. Um, I realize this is the wrong um, slide, but anyway, I'll describe what it should be. Uh, so you see exclusion, integration, and the third one is inclusion. The third one is actually the one that's actually not accurate, because in the third one, what I have is Instead of a circle for inclusion or belonging, it's actually multiple circles. That means it's blown up. And what I'm trying to capture in that is that when you fully belong, it's not simply that you're joining somebody else's thing, that you're actually co-creating something new. So when you fully belong, uh, it's not you belong to my thing or I belong to your thing. It's like we belong to our thing that we are co-creating while we're belonging. Um, yeah, so. Uh, so it's a little different than just inclusion in that respect. Oh, there it is. Uh, so this is what belonging looks like. Um, and so your participation, your membership uh, is critical. Now, one of the things that's happening in the world today is uh, a move with right-wing nationalism. Uh, and sometimes it takes on the form of race, as it does here in the United States but also it can take on the form of immigration, as Steve mentioned. It can take on the form of religion. Uh, it can take on the form of uh, sexual preference. But they all have something in common. Uh, there's, there's always the, some other that's pointed out that so supposedly it's a problem. And this is actually growing worldwide. Um, it's not just a US phenomena. And part of the thing that's happening is that the world is becoming, in intimate terms, more diverse. So it used to be that people stayed wherever they were born. That's not true anymore. People are moving a lot. Um, and as we deal with change, we also deal with, it creates anxiety. 
the human body can only process so much change in a short period of time without creating anxiety. And I tell the story of my granddaughter starting school and she was five years old and, and a, 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 a hypothetical conversation with my daughter. So it's, my granddaughter's name is Alma. It's like, okay, Alma, tomorrow you go to school for the first day. You go to kindergarten. It's like, so what is kindergarten? Well, uh, it's where a lot of big people hang out in the school and the other kids and some of the kids are bullies and they're gonna take your lunch money and, <laughs> and you know, then my granddaughter or any granddaughter is gonna say, you know what, actually, I'm okay. I don't really need to do this kindergarten thing. <laughs> uh, the other would be, you're gonna make new friends, you're gonna learn to draw and read, uh, you can have play dates. Now it's like, wow, can I go right away? And so the first one is called breaking. When you think of the change and the other as somehow threatening to who you are, uh, and, um, and therefore you wanna keep them at bay or you wanna control them. Um, and when you see all the stuff that's happening around the country, I'm, I'm trying to, let me write about this this weekend. It's like whether you go to a coffee shop or whether you're trying to walk across the stage or whether you're studying and decide to take a nap, somehow someone says, you are a threat. Uh, I mean, really, people barbecuing, black people barbecuing in Oakland? It's like, what's strange about that? Uh, <laughs> but here's, here's the other part that's really weird, right? It's not simply, and these are usually white people who are doing this, uh, and this is not a slam on white people. Uh, people, white people feel like, oh wow, there's a black person in this space, it must be dangerous. There's a black person sleeping, it must be dangerous. There's a black person walking, it must be dangerous. They call the police. They call the state. Now the crazy part is that the state comes. <laughs> so can you imagine, excuse me officer, I'm sitting here in a Yale dorm, uh, and there's a black woman sleeping uh, with, on top of her books. Um, don't wake her up, she might be dangerous. Uh, I'll be right there. So why would the police come? What, what are they telling the police? Uh, and all of you, my guess is many of you have had either experiences directly or indirectly. Uh, and this is a form of breaking. And what always happens in this is that then someone comes and they say, the police followed all the rules. And then I say, what are those damn rules? You know, follow all the rules. They shoot somebody. They kill somebody. And when people protest, they say, we checked it. The police followed all the rules. He was running away and the police couldn't catch him. So he had to send something faster, a bullet. Um, he followed the rules. I'm saying, what are the rules? And part of that last slide, when I talked about when you join something, you change the structure, is that part of the things we have to do is change these rules. Now here's the tease for the mind science. It's not saying all the people engaged in this are necessarily racist or intentionally racist in, a, in the normal sense. Some of them certainly are. Uh, some of them are uh, intentionally racist and some of them are strategically racist. Some of them are you know, proud to be racist. Uh, but many people are not. Many people just feel uncomfortable and they're affected by the unconscious. And I'm not gonna give a whole thing on the unconscious just for the sake of time, but uh, the unconscious does a lot of things. It sorts into categories, it creates uh, connections, uh, and it fills in gaps. Two quick things. The unconscious is very, very big and super fast. The conscious is extremely small and extremely slow. Just to give you a tease, the unconscious process 11 million bits of information a second. 11 million bits of information a second. During that same second, the conscious process processes 40. So the conscious is actually doing nothing. All the work is being done by the unconscious. And here's the last rub. The unconscious is not individual. The unconscious is social. The unconscious is actually reflecting what's happening in larger society. So it's not that someone's secretly unconsciously racist. It's like if, it's, if they're dealing with racialized stuff, it's because it's reflecting what's happening in the larger society. Just a tease. So. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but which of these is darker, square A or square B? Okay. They're the same color. 
A in. So it looks like A, most people think it's A, but there's always one in the audience who, you know, has been reading or studying or messing up my, my talk. <laughs> <laughs> but they're the same size, I mean, same shade. The thing is that the conscious mind actually sees what it expects to see. And because of the cylinder casting a shadow, the unconscious mind adjusts it, but actually A and, a and B are the same. And by that, we're suggesting that the unconscious actually is engaging in the world in a creative way. It's not just reflecting in the world. If you expect to some, see someone being dangerous, they are dangerous. If you expect to see someone with a gun, they have a gun. Uh, and it's not that people, so when people say literally, I saw him with a gun, a policeman said, I can't find it. They're not necessarily lying. If the unconscious expects to see it, it will be seen. Um, this is a stroke test, and I'm going to do this very quickly. What I want you to do when I show you a color, I want you to say it out loud with a little gust. I know it's early in the morning. And uh, I don't want you, if, if there are anything else, letters or words, ignore those. We're only interested in the color. Is that clear? All right, no words, no letters, just the color. And we're going to go at a pretty good clip. I think you get a C minus. Uh, <laughs> so let me just quickly tell you what was happening, why this is important. Uh, I told you not to read the words. Uh, I'm, my guess is you read the words. Here's the thing. You're unconscious. You can't turn it off. Uh, and so when there's a tension between your conscious and your unconscious, as the word is one color and the letter is another color, your con it slows you down. It actually creates cognitive stress. Um, so when people say they don't notice that I'm black, they're saying maybe, maybe their conscious didn't notice. I don't even believe that. But, uh, but the unconscious is like, oh, yeah, we noticed. Uh, we had a meeting. We sent a memo. Uh, <laughs> remember, the unconscious is very fast. So it does that before the conscious can even come online. So we notice each other. We see each other. And that's a good thing. To be, we all need to be seen. So I'm going to spend the rest of my talk mainly talking about targeted universalism and why targeted universalism. And again, as I said, it's actually equity 2.0. Uh, so a lot of times there are universal strategies or universal programs, and I'm suggesting those don't really work. And then at other times we say, okay, if universal programs don't work, we'll have targeted programs. But I'm suggesting those don't work either. So don't distress. I figured out what works. It's called targeted universalism. You combine those two things together, and it begins to work. And I'll be saying more about that in a minute. So let's say we're trying to get everyone to be able to look over the fence. Um, now, uh, it's, as you can see here, the people are standing on different structures. And so they need different interventions to be able to see over the fence. And this is what targeted universalism is about. Um, First of all, you have to have a universal goal. In this case, the goal is to seal the defense. Um, now, the difference between target universalism and equity and e equality is simply this. Uh, and Angela and I, actually, it's interesting, Steve talked about this. Um, equity was not part of the, the lexicon in public discourse in the 1990s. And Angela Glover Blackwell, Manuel Pastor, and myself went around the con country talking about it and getting uninvited to places. It's like, oh, here they come again with that equity BS. Uh, and, and it's actually taken off. Uh, so Angela, we were all friends. She was not happy when I started talking about target universalism. It's like, we finally got a foot in the door on equity, and you're now talking about target universalism. And I'm saying, there's a mistake that people make when they talk about equity. And that is, they think equity is simply closing gaps between people. So they focus on the disparities. Uh, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actually focusing on a stated universal goal, which is different than, uh, I mean, you can imagine that no one could see over the fence. There'd be no disparity. Uh, but there's not, that's not the goal. And so we don't want to say whatever the dominant group has, whether they're whites or other, that's what we want. 
because, you know, right now, as you know, in much of America, there's an opioid crisis that the heart of it right now is in the white community. So should we actually say, we need to make sure we get opioids more into the black and Latino community because they're not dying enough. Um, that would be closing the gap. But that's not the goal we want. So in equality, it says, we want to treat everybody the same. Well, the thing about treating everybody the same is that we're not all the same. Uh, and so when we say we're going to treat everybody the same, uh, it doesn't take us where we want to go. So target universalism acknowledges that structures actually do something. Structures are not neutral. They are designed to do some work. Your chair is designed to hold you. Your table is designed to hold your stuff. So structures are always doing something. So what we need to do is to have structures that actually do the work we want to in terms of producing the outcome which we want. And one of those outcomes is belonging. We want structures that say we belong. Uh, and how can the structures say we, do, we don't belong? Well, hundreds of ways. First of all, if you have a, uh, what's called a disability, if you're in a wheelchair, does the structure allow, even allow you in the space? Uh, if you have hearing impairment, uh, if you're tall, uh, now I'm a little tall, uh, and when I was at Ohio State, they had a rule that if you were doing stuff on Ohio State business, you had to actually, and you went into a car, you had to rent a subcompact. And I said, I'm not renting a subcompact. Paying, using my own money. And I said, that's the rule. Everybody does it. It's universal. And I, I said, I'm not doing it, I'm sorry. Uh, so they called the dean who was head of all things unimportant. Uh, <laughs> And they said, Professor Powell won't get a subcompact. It went all the way up to the chancellor. And the chancellor said, OK, you can rent a big car. But we're not changing the rules. What that did was to stigmatize me. I became the problem. Instead of the, instead of the structure being not designed for me, it was that I was the problem. And then when I drive around, people would say, there goes Professor Powell. He thinks he's all that in his big car. Uh, so, it, there are all these ways in which we can think about our structures designed to actually support different groups. So first you establish a uh, universal goal, then you assess the performance of a group in relationship with the goal, uh, and then you, you actually figure out what you need to do structurally, culturally, to actually get the group to the uh, goal. Uh, and, um, and those structures, those strategies are targeted. They're targeted based on the group's situation within structure. Now notice, it's not fixing the group. It's fixing the structures to actually make them work for the group. And it can't be one size. They can't all be the same. Uh, and so that's what target universal is. Again, universal goal, targeted strategy based on how we're situated within cultures and structures. Uh, it's a way of talking about race, it's a way of talking about gender, it's a way of talking about disability, it's a way of talking about, because all of us are situated within structures. And what race means, in, in many ways, is how we're situated differently within those structures. What access we have to resources or not. So again, we don't want to s just look at where we are in relationship to whites. It's in relationship to the universal goal. Uh, uh, so whites don't become normalized in this respect. Now this is actually a operational strategy and a communication strategy. Because when you state those universal goals, it's gonna turn out in many instances that whites don't have it either. So they may need, so it's not saying you just focus on the most vulnerable. It's saying you look at how all the groups are situated in relationship to those universal goals. Now it's gonna turn out that the most vulnerable groups are gonna need more or different things than other groups, but everybody's gonna need something. Um, and if you fix the structure, everyone benefits. This can, now you can look at problems at different levels, at the individual, institutional, structural, or global level. And each time, your intervention then needs to be at that level. In the United States, we tend to be individualistic, so we don't oftentimes pay attention to structures. If, if, if uh, I'm uncomfortable, it's something wrong with me. Let's fix me. 
let's teach me how to do yoga, and then I can get into that little car and be comfortable. <laughs> Nothing against yoga, although I don't like little cars. Uh, so here are some examples uh, in, of targeted universalism. Um, in Austin, they said they wanted to have parks within uh, one quarter to half a mile of every neighborhood. That meant largely building parks in the Latino community. Uh, but by framing it in terms of targeting universalism, you avoid the things of why are you only caring about Latinos? Uh, we're caring about everybody. Uh, Latinos are further away from parks, and that has serious consequences in terms of health. Um, but it, it avoided the question that targeted strategies sometimes have. You only care about those people, and you don't care about us. So think about this. Think about something like Black Lives Matters. You know, and I'm, I'm always shocked when, even in California, I'm driving along, and I see a sign saying, White Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. Because what Black Lives Matter is saying is Black Lives Matter too. It's not saying other lives don't matter, but it's saying the way our society is organized right now, we don't recognize the lives of black people. There's never been, at least in my recent history, uh, someone who says, I was shot by the police because I was white. So when, when, when a black person being shot by the police is saying, I'm shot because I was black. Oh, I was harassed because I'm gay. Not because I was doing anything wrong. Oh, yeah, I was breathing, too. I forgot, I forgot you know. Uh, so, uh, and here in Seattle is another example. Um, basically saying everybody should have the universal goal. Everybody should have uh, competent swimming techniques. Now, for those of you who don't know this, uh, at least historically, blacks were not, allowed, were not allowed to be taught to read or to swim. Uh, and, um, and so blacks are disproportionate in terms of swimmers. And that's why they make such a big deal when a black person won a gold medal at the Olympics. Uh, but to say, so you could say we're going to teach black people to swim, okay? Or you could say we're going to teach everybody to swim, but the white people already know how to swim. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. So anyway, the point is, is that if you adopt a universal goal and then you adopt the strategies uh, to, to do that. Now, if, you, if you're going to learn to swim, you have a swimming pool, it's pretty easy. If, you don't, if you're going to learn to swim and there's no swimming pool in your neighborhood, it's a whole different thing. Uh, so it's targeted strategies based on how people are situated. My clicker is a little slow. Um, universal goal to provide, uh, to address cultural barriers. Uh, and now, when you say swimming, think about this. Uh, there's some cultures where women and men cannot swim together. And this happened, this, this happened in Seattle, so they said we want to teach people to swim. And Seattle, they want to have single-sex swimming. But then somebody said, we're going to sue you if you do it because that's gender discrimination. Uh, so they actually collaborated with the YMCA to actually address this. So they needed to de de deal with a particular strategy for people who um, don't allow uh, swimming with men and women. This, um, so this is from a young person who's saying, Spread the word all across the nation. We're going to be a great generation. I know that's true. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter. Uh, I know some of you out here. And I, I just want to apologize right now. Uh, I'm uh, in the baby boomer generation. Man, we made a mess. Uh, and I mean that in all seriousness. As a generation, we made an absolute mess. And I could see how you would be a little you know, depressed, mad, angry. Uh, we're still trying to clean it up, but ultimately, a lot of that's going to fall to you. Um, I had a couple of the slides that didn't show, but let me just end with saying this. So I have uh, one slide and another PowerPoint um, that I thought this one was, where a guy is going, where they build an escalator and um, take the guy to the third floor. Uh, and someone comes along in a wheelchair. 
we could put the person on the wheelchair on the escalator, they'd be kind of clumsy, they might fall, uh, or we could build an elevator. Once we build the elevator, they actually support everyone, not just the person on the escalator. Uh, so the elevator is one of the ways of addressing target universalism. Uh, and so when we look around, we see that all over the place. And I'll end just by saying this. Think about uh, school suspension. If two students are be behaving the same way, should they be treated the same? What do you think the answer is? No, why not? That's the right answer, but why? Okay, the, the right answer, the reason is because the students could actually be doing the same thing, but for different reasons. So in terms of uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, black students are about six to seven times more likely to have post-traumatic stress syndrome than their white counterparts. Latinos about three or four times. So it's, a, so it's a good chance when a student is acting out, if he's black or she's black, he's actually having an episode, a medical episode. A white student is having a behavior episode. They look the same. But if you understand how they're situated, the intervention should be and have to be different. And most schools have not caught up with that. Uh, so that's, again, just an example of target universalism. Thank you. All right, so um, this is always the awkward moment when we build the panel, bring the chairs up. Uh, what a wonderful, the best version of uh, Jeopardy music ever is Q&A with John Powell, right? Um, so as we uh, do this and then, um, and then we'll sit down and have a conversation about targeted universalism and whatever else folks want to talk about. Uh, John, let me just ask you about, it's a bigger frame, but the, in your book, uh, a big part of the first part of the book, which I read last night, um, really sort of debunks uh, the post-racial narrative in our country. And it, it, I think you published it in 2012, is that right? So um, it, it, you know, you sort of spent some time sort of saying, well, you know, just because the president is African-American, please don't, yeah. you know, use that narrative. I, I assume, um, and so I kept reading it going, holy crap, I gotta ask him, like, now that Trump is the president of the United States, like, you know, that seemed like a big, uh, see, I told you so moment. But how do you explain, you know, the, the othering and the moment we're in um, mm -hmm. as it relates to the election? What's your, you know, your sort of short but um, still insightful yeah. uh, thoughts about, about how we got to that place uh, post-Obama? I guess a couple of things. One, um, they're organizing principles for society. So societies have a ways in which they create a sense of belonging and othering, and it changed across society. So I spent, um, I was, I'm working on a new book on othering and belonging, and I was in Paris a couple of years ago, uh, and I was talking about race, and the Parisians were saying, you know, we don't do race, we don't, you know, everybody here, you're French or not French, you know, that's the thing. And I said, so you don't do any othering. We don't, you know, we don't have any racial problems. We don't even keep racial data. Okay, great. Uh, although there are, suburbs where it's all black, but okay, whatever. Uh, I said, what about Muslims? Oh, you know, so immediately they understood that Muslims was a, uh, from the French perspective, deeply other. Uh, and so Le Pen, the right-wing group that did well, every, um, uh, every election, they blast the Muslims. Um, so in the United States, what happened, I think two things happened. One. Uh, the right wing strategically decide to use the fear of the other, the changing demographics. We talk about the country's going to be majority not white by 2050. It drives many people crazy at an unconscious level. Mm. It creates this deep anxiety. Now, I've talked about change creating anxiety. What the Republicans have been able to do, and I know this is not political, uh, some of you may be Republicans, uh, but anyway, the point is they strategically use the anxiety of racial change of demographic change to create a narrative about the United States, actually. And the, the Democrats felt like the way you deal with it is not to notice race. So Republicans are like, race, 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 race. The Democrats are like, we won't notice race. Can we talk about the economy, anybody? Can we talk about something else? Uh, and, uh, and the official word coming out of, more or less out of the Democratic Party after Obama got elected was, 
post-racialism. I literally got kicked out of a conference because I, said, I gave a talk saying the changing demographics at an unconscious level is creating deeper racial anxiety, not just for whites, but for whites and all of us. And people need help in terms of making sense of that. Uh, that's what a narrative does. The Democrats didn't have a narrative. Their narrative was colorblindness, not to see race or post-racialism. Uh, the the, the um, Republicans started off using dog whistle, that is, you know, subtle racial, you know, like those people on welfare, Obama's the welfare president. And then with Trump, they, put, they used the bullhorn. Yeah. Uh, and we still, we have to find out a way of talking about race. I am by just saying this. So even now, we have an election coming up, most of the Democratic Party believe that you can't talk about race without really scaring white people. And so they try to avoid talking about race. Really, and, they, and even Bernie Sanders will say, that's identity politics. We can't do identity politics. He's wrong. Mm. All politics are identity politics. What he's really saying, we can't do breaking politics. We can't do politics where we look at one group at the expense of another group. Instead, we, but we have to acknowledge each group's identity and connect it. Uh, the Democrats haven't done that. So you only have one team on the field mm -hmm. dealing with race, Republicans, which is amazing. Uh, and even those of us who do r r racial justice work and even youth justice work, m many of our narratives are breaking narratives. They're not bridging narratives. Yeah. And so that's what's missing in the United States. Uh, we need to create a larger, inclusive we. Great. Let's create a larger. Grab a seat, please. You can take it. Come on up. Uh, Trisha Rakes is coming on up. And uh, a lot of you are familiar with Trisha. She helped to lead the Rakes Foundation. Uh, has had many high-level positions at places like Microsoft, and um, we're going to enjoy uh, Tricia and Luz Vega Marquis, who many of you are familiar with, who runs uh, the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Um, so here comes some bridges for this conversation, and we'll we'll get started. John, I have like 12 more questions for you, but I'm not going to. I think as a as we turn to our panelists to reflect on your your conversation with us thus far. I, I do want to just ask you to say a little more about whiteness, um, because I, you, you, the point you just raised about the backlash against identity politics and you know, a number of national thinkers, David Brooks writes about mm -hmm. how terrible identity politics is all the time. And, and just talk about, because whiteness is an identity, and I, I, I've heard you say it's not white people that are the problem, it is this notion of whiteness. So will you just say a little more about that, and then we'll, we'll yes, bring in our... Uh, so as Steve says, the, the basically, um, and I talk about this a lot in my book, uh, the, the whiteness is an ideology, and it's a very dangerous ideology. Uh, and I, I say this sometimes, so whiteness as an ideology needs to control, needs to separate, and it's extremely fearful. Uh, and think about it. So um, there's this thing called black blood, and black blood is super powerful. I don't know how many of you saw Black Panther, but he, you know, <laughs> black blood, that stuff that they were, that was black blood. But anyway, uh, the idea is that one drop of black blood will destroy whiteness. One drop. Uh, now that's a powerful stuff. But the, the truth of the matter is there's no such thing as black blood. Uh, what we really are dealing with is white fragility. And the reason it's fragile is because anytime something is pure, it's also both a lie and fragile. Because something, when something is pure, one something else, one drop of any something else destroys that purity. And so whiteness sort of got wrapped up in this purity as an ideology uh, full of angst, the need to sort of control the other, the need to sort of police the other, the need to be separate from the other, uh, the need to dominate. So whiteness has all that built into it. Now that's not white people. That's the ideology of whiteness. Uh, and so I'm not suggesting that we get rid of white people. Uh, I'm suggesting I'm not suggesting we build. I'm suggesting we build bridges. Uh, but there needs to be an identity that's not predicated upon dominance. And uh, there's a long story about that. I won't go into it. But uh, th the reason that people in those spaces feel fearful when they see a black person is like. This is a white space. Uh, and there were a number of 
conservative whites who said after Obama was elected president, they could not get out of bed. That the idea that a black man was in charge of the United States was so devastating to so many people. Uh, and they had to actually other him. So he became a Muslim. He became uh, not an American. He became you know, a terrorist. He became, and it's actually interesting, see, the, the Trump picked up on that, the Bertha that uh, Obama wasn't really born in the United States. You know where he got that from? Russia. Literally, Russia fed that to him because Russia studies race. Russia studies the United States, and they know if you want to mess with the United States, the secret sauce is race. Uh, so we need to really step into that, and we need to step into it in a way that actually the hard edge about race is not white, it's not blacks, it's not Latinos, it's not Native Americans, it's whiteness. And we really need to name it without necessarily uh, shaming or attacking or disparaging people who are phenotypically white. And I'll end by saying, I believe in a really healthy society, no one would have to spend their whole life live, living in whiteness. What a terrible thing to have to do. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and I don't think Rush is a great segue to Tricia, so I'm going to pick <laughs> something else uh, uh, in the conversation. But uh, Tricia, let's start with you. Uh, you helped to run the Race Foundation. Um, and you, it's a pretty young foundation just getting started, and even more so really getting started on this notion of, of <coughs> developing a grant-making strategy that reflects targeted universalism. I, I take it you and John have known each other, uh, met before, um, but could you just talk a little bit about the journey you're on that you've begun uh, uh, as you think about the sort of lessons learned that we just experienced together the last half hour or so? Sure, sure. Well, I, I have to say John's um, presentation really resonates with me on a number of levels. I think as a philanthropist, um, I view part of my responsibility is to really be aware of um, practices and, and approaches that the sector has historically done, you know, what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, and to really try to discern um, how we can uh, do work more effectively. And so I think um, John's presentation um, with, you know, targeted universalism has really resonated um, in that regard. And I think it's particularly timing to, timely for our work at the Rakes Foundation because Given where we are in the life cycle of our strategies, we have really um, uh, recently sort of stopped to reflect on how we're doing our work uh, and how we'd like to do our work differently going forward. So uh, John's work has been a huge inspiration uh, to our work, and we're very early in our journey on targeted universalism, but we're really trying to hold each other accountable and really putting it into, into practice uh, in our strategies. I think all of us here have uh, seen that there's been an enormous uh, effort both on the philanthropic front as well as the uh, sort of the public sector and in policy to really improve the outcomes for our young people. But that stubborn equity gap continues to remain. It's something that has haunted our sector for quite some time. So I think John's uh, body of work is very refreshing in terms of how we need to really look at the work differently and try to move from universal solutions, which we have seen don't end up with the result that we intend, and oftentimes people that need, um, uh, that are furthest from the opportunity uh, aren't being served well by those solutions. So I think John's presentation sort of affirms that equity explicit approach to the work, and we are very excited about really taking a different approach to identifying problems uh, and developing solutions. Great. Is there, um, how, what does that look like? Just a little more on how you all are thinking about this in terms of, you know, part of, I think, the struggle is, and, and I've heard Jeff Rakes, your partner in this, uh, sort of talk about, um, very transparently about, uh, you know, getting coaching on his privilege, for example. Uh, it's not something you often hear uh, uh, a leader of a philanthropy, a philanthropist speak to. Is that is that part of what it means to change and to evolve as a philanthropy internally? Or can you talk a little bit about operationalizing targeted universalism a, l a little more? 
It has clearly been a journey. Um, I think a number of years ago, um, our staff um, has really, we've been talking about it, and obviously in our work, um, we in, uh, intend to uh, make sure that we um, sort of address those people that are le uh, furthest from opportunity or those that are least well served by the system. But I think it's another matter in terms of putting it into practice. Um, we've been on a journey now for a number of years. We have actually brought in uh, coaching to the entire staff. We are also each um, have access to individual coaching. And we've all um, made the commitment to each other that we're going to hold each other sort of accountable when, when we slip and fall. And I think Jeff and I, um, we are first-gen philanthropists, so we are not really burdened with uh, doing work um, uh, in a historical way. And so we do have the freedom to innovate. And I think the sector that we come from, the high-tech sector, change was always sort of the order of the day. So I think we're quite um, comfortable working in that space that involve risks, that, that involves risk, um, really committed to innovating and really questioning the status quo and the approaches that have taken place. And so we um, are really trying to create that brave space for ourselves. And I think Jeff and I, being um, white trustees of a foundation, we know we have a lot to learn. Um, we are committed to that journey. And, um, and we want to be transparent about our journey with others. We're hoping that uh, by really sharing um, sort of our foibles and our missteps, that that will make it a welcoming space for others to join us. Awesome. And, and you're championing John with <laughs> other donors, which is terrific. Yeah. Um, so old stodgy institutional philanthropy, Luce. Yeah. That's, uh, That's me. <laughs> <laughs> that is not you. Uh, you've been able to overcome uh, a lot of that in terms of the approach at, at Marjorie Casey. And I mean, I, I want to give you a chance first to respond to anything that may have resonated as John did his piece. Uh, but I also want to talk about what you've built at Marguerite and, and the philosophy behind that. I think mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a targeted philosophy. I don't know if it's a targeted universal philosophy. We can ask the professor uh, uh, that when we get going. But any, it, your first reactions and then a little bit about how Marguerite is structured. Yes. Well, good morning. I'm very delighted to be here with you, especially seeing so many young people in the crowd. That's great. But John, I think of Marguerite Casey Foundation as a bridger. Mm. Um, because, uh, you know, I come to the, as the other, right? It, it's been, I, I've worked in philanthropy all my life, one of those strange individuals that actually built a career out of it. And, and I've learned um, how to overcome being the other. And I've done that in philanthropy by holding people accountable. And that's a very hard job to do. Let me tell you, it's very frustrating because you, you go to meetings, you talk to people, and then all of a sudden, I raise a point about people of color and, well, you always talk about that. I said, because you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who's gonna bring that point up? So I think bridging, the, 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 it's been, a really important part of our work. At Marguerite Casey Foundation, um, I, I, I've been called uh, an outlier hmm. in a positive way. That I think the work that we have created, uh, first of all, you need to know, we support movement building of low-income families. And we do it with the intention and the philosophy because we believe that in this country, we really other the poor, mm -hmm. uh, terribly so. And we do it to the way that we don't even hear them. We don't see them in the room. We talk about them like they don't exist. And that's really awful. But we at Marguerite Casey Foundation believe that no, no family should live in poverty in the richest country in the world. And that families, thank you. Thank you. And the families have the wherewithal to make contributions to finding solutions to their own problems. And how do we practice that? It's been a challenge. But uh, but what we do is uh, we work with cornerstone organizations in 13 states, and we provide sizable general support grants, and then we get out of the way. We trust the grantees to do the work that they set themselves up to do. And that's, I think, one of the most important things we could do as a foundation. And then, because we, uh, we don't fund by issue, we fund... Uh, 
activism and advocacy. And we bring a lot of issues together that the, the families decide what issues are important in the different communities. And so we created these networks, 16 networks across the United States, where people are coming together to forge common solutions. And it's a wonderful thing to experience because the, you know, it's taken a while. Uh, the foundation is, um, wow, 17 years old. And I'm the inaugural president. So I work with my board um, constantly to make sure that we are always looking for ways to do things better, to innovate, to support our grantees in a more productive way. For example, um, I don't know why I didn't think of it sooner. We're gonna bring um, lobbying experience to them. We're gonna train them how to do that work. If our goal is to change systems and policies that affect them, we should teach them how to do this better in DC or at the state level. So, and uh, they, we're gonna do that. So I think we support them in many, many different ways. Um, so I think, but, but the networks I think have become a key point for, for doing our work. And I would say that in terms of learning how to work, uh, I, another thing that I wanna share with you, and this may sound like I'm bragging because perhaps I am. <laughs> <laughs> our board is eight, comprised of 80% people of color. 80%. That never happens in philanthropy, but it can be done and done really well. My staff is 60% people of color because we believe in, in, in philanthropy best practices says that in order to reach out to communities of color, you gotta get, have people on, on the staff that look like those folks. Absolutely. And we practice that. So that's been really, really important contribution that we have made. So and. Our grantees are 80, led by, 85% of them are led by people of color and communities of color. Mm -hmm. But we don't exclude white people. We are in middle Appalachia. And, and uh, we're trying to bring people together in these conversations and be courageous about talking about race. And uh, sometimes it works, but sometimes, thanks God for <laughs> translation, and <laughs> the people don't know what was said because <laughs> it has been really challenging. But, but you know, I believe in the, what, so I should tell you also, I'm an immigrant. Mm -hmm. So coming to this country with, uh, as a child, mm. uh, it's been a wonderful experience to see this democracy in action. Yeah, I remember my parents coming out when uh, Nixon was um, uh, resigned, coming to get us out of school, grammar school, because they thought that there was gonna be a civil war. Mm -hmm. That's what we experienced, that's what we know. So, but, but I think to experience the beauty of this country and appreciate it and want it to make it better, not the way, the way that Mr. Trump talks about it, but in a way that is inclusive and a bridger of all these points of view, we can make a difference. A and I think one piece of news, America is not browning. America is brown already, and we cannot stop it. Mm. And we're gonna have to deal with that, and I hope that our friends, uh, we need white folks to become less fragile of the concept of whiteness, as you explained it, because we need to work together to create a better future for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, John, I don't know if you want to respond. I, I do want to give you a shout out because you also do 10 years of support on, on average with your grantees yeah, and yeah. general support yeah. in terms of funding. Um, and I want to take us to systems change, yes. which John talks a lot in his book about structures and systems, and, and both of you work on systems change. I think Rates deserves a lot of credit for pushing the local systems here uh, through that lens of, of targeted universalism. Uh, you all, I, you know, I think of Marguerite Casey as the funder of the folks who, you know, kind of say, if you don't have a seat at the p table, if you're not if you're not belonging, bring a folding chair. Yes. I think that's a Shirley Chisholm quote. But you fund the folks with the folding chair who yes. show up to get at, <laughs> to to not be othered, to be bridged, and they force a bridge when necessary. Um, so I think there's different approaches to systems change. I want to go there, but John, a quick reaction to that, and then maybe bring us into a systems change discussion. Well, I, I think um, um, I, I appreciate the work that. Um, uh, under Luth leadership uh, it's been phenomenal and um, uh, and Tricia Rice I think I think uh, you have to have people who frankly are in a position of uh, influence and power who are willing to take risks um, and and to build those bridges I think that's really really important 
And I also think that, um, that we have to center the voices of those who are most marginalized. Not exclusive, but those voices have to be centered and lifted up. And, and when you're looking at those universals, the one thing I would say is the universals are universal. So they're not just what's good for the black community, or Latino community, or the youth. It's what's good for us collectively. Um, and, um, and it does take hard work. And the last thing I'll say is that in systems change, you're really focused on the outcome. You're less concerned about the inputs. You're less concerned about people's intent. What is the system really doing? Uh, and if it's not doing it, the data becomes really important because it tells you where the system is breaking down. You don't have to say, well, it's breaking down because so-and-so is bad. Maybe so-and-so is bad. But it's not, it's not working. So you design a system, a structure, to produce the outcomes you want. That is a really hard-edged thing in terms of accountability. Okay. You want to build on that at all, Chris? You all have invested. We hear from our grantee partners at the Roadmap Project that Rakes is a key ally in moving systems yeah. change here. So maybe I'll step back um, and just give a, a, a bit of context for the Rakes Foundation. Um, we're just passionate about young people. Um, our grant making is primarily for young people and the systems that support their development. We really um, aspire to work at a systems level, really breaking down the barriers that get in the way of our young people being able to really achieve their full potential. And we also work at sort of building up healthy environments in which our young people uh, live, learn, and play. Um, our strategy areas are in the um, education realm, in youth homelessness, as well as um, opportunity youth. And I think one of the things as we evolve how we uh, do our grant making is the realization that um, all of those, there's, there's interrelationships between um, sort of all of those those experiences that our young people have. Our marginalized youth um, have disproportionate experiences with disciplinary treatment in schools. They um, sometimes their system involved with foster care system or juvenile justice. They're more likely to drop out of school, um, be disconnected, um, and they are more likely to drop into homelessness. And when they drop into homelessness, they're further marginalized and that vicious cycle starts again. So, what we're really trying to do is look at how we are evolving our grant making and making, making it less siloed uh, and really understanding um, sort of where our young people are. They don't experience these systems individually. They're all wrapped in together and we're really trying to, to learn and to listen. Um, and for us, it's really important to have um, young people at the table. Uh, they have been wise advisors to us um, sharing their stories and their lived experiences. And it's really important, as John said, for that to really inform the work. Um, so we are um, really in the midst of um, sort of our evolution now. I mean, I can talk about a couple of examples sort of early in our targeted universalism yeah. journey. Um, certainly locally here with our OY work within the, um, the opportunity uh, youth frame here, We've identified that our Latinx population involved in our, um, uh, in our programming, um, sort of the, um, they, they are the largest um, uh, demographic group in the re-engagement program, but they are the lowest percentage of um, groups that actually have a, attained a credential. So we're really trying to reach out and understand uh, what we can do better to serve that population of young people. And the administrators are really doing a, a conducting listening tours to really work with the kids, understand how we can really shift the designs of some of our programs to better serve uh, those youth. There's another program in Oakland that we're quite excited about, the African American Male Achievement Program in the Oakland Unified School. And it is uh, sort of baked into uh, uh, the, the, uh, the curriculum during the day, and it's a cohort of young uh, black students that are taught exclusively by black teachers and facilitators that really help to develop that sense of belonging, that sense of purpose and relevance, and that affirmation of racial identity. Um, and they're finding some really remarkable uh, results. We won't have the uh, research practice um, results until next summer, but uh, the early returns are showing 
that they are much more connected to school, so the performance in school has improved, but also they are finding their place and their roles and responsibilities in community as well. So we're very excited about um, some of that work, and the Oakland uh, School District is really thinking about how to expand their learnings there to, to other demographics. Uh, other demographic populations, and there are other school districts that uh, are really trying to replicate it in their schools. So those are a couple of examples of things that we are uh, doing to really explore um, our foray into uh, infusing targeted universalism into our work. Fantastic. And our colleagues from Urban Strategies Council in Oakland are going to find you after this <laughs> panel, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, Luz, do you want to get the last word on, on the systems change piece of what you all have been working on? And then we're going to uh, turn to our young uh, leaders who are going to offer up some questions and some response, responses to this great conversation. The way we approach systems change is by uh, some philanthropies doing within the system. Mm -hmm. We do it outside the system. We put pressure on the system by funding organizations that advocate, heavily advocate on behalf of, uh, of changes in, in that system. In, in Los Angeles County, for example, uh, the Community Coalition and uh, uh, has been working really hard. And they, they just recently won this, uh, this uh, maybe it's targeted universalism because they're gonna put more money in the schools to help the kids that, don't, that are really needing more help than, than others. So I think that was uh, just a victory that happened yeah. just the other day. But I think that's the approach we take. It's outside pressuring, uh, pressuring the system. Because you know, one of the things is, yes, we use data. Yes, we believe in experts and we talk with them. But the experts we see is also community people because we believe they also have solutions. And that's a strategy that is not often used in philanthropy. And uh, it is really too bad. In 2008, we spent uh, the whole year um, talking to people in communities, we brought together 30,000 people, the, the directly uh, real families in this country, not just through the organizations, that put together um, a plan of action. It's a, we call it our, the platform. And to me, it's a very significant and important legacy document for the work of the foundation, because it is truly the voices of families. Uh, uh, we had. 65 town halls across the, all the uh, states where we fund. So it's just been a really interesting experiment in really elevating the voices of families in a very, uh, in a very concrete and intentional way of hearing what the families really need. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Go, if you haven't seen the sort of work that Marguerite Casey's done to help organize families across the country, check out, go to the Marguerite Casey <laughs> website. That'll take you to the yeah. Equal Voice website. Yeah. And Luce's point about coming as an immigrant, she just wrote a piece about uh, sort of the experience of being a dreamer before the dreamers, if, yeah. if I can call it that. Yeah. And I think it was really important to young people who are struggling uh, with the uncertainty right now to have a leader step in and say, I, I think your line was, my heart breaks for, for yeah. them, I, I cried for them. Um, so let's, uh, you mentioned, let's talk to the experts. So I'm gonna ask Shanice and Ryan just to jump in here. Where are you guys um, as our respondents? And uh, Should we go? You, you guys can decide who goes first. Ryan from New Orleans. Of course, it's always awkward standing up in the middle of a crowd full of people like at a table. Um, but I think we decided who was going to um, go, and we've both been like writing um, since you guys started the panel. So first, I just want to say thank you guys for um, just the work that you do and um, your, your intention um, um, and, and focus and, and, um, and, and just the, the richness of, of what you add to the conversation. Um, I read some of the book. Um, for some reason, I feel like I've read things from you before. I know I have. <laughs> um, um, and then on the, on the funding piece, I think um, uh, something that was touched on, uh, it's two things that really stuck out to me. One of the things that was touched on was the family um, focus um, and talking about how young people are the agents and the change makers and not just young people, but the community um, 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 and how essential they are to this process. Um, but the, I think for a lot of communities, the gap um, not closing the gap, Mr. John, but the gap um, that exists 
is where is the training, where is the, the empowerment, the true um, readiness, the preparation for young people to um, serve and show up in these systems um, um, in an intentional way, um, as opposed to just having them show up at a table. We, um, countless, countless, countless of times we talk about how young people are the experts of their experience, um, how communities have the solutions, um, mm -hmm. how families should be the focus. And now I feel like it's in a strategic conversation now. Um, and I think the next step is, when we talk about this, is capacity, et cetera, funding, resources. Um, and I think my question is like, what's, um, I guess, our approach to rolling out an actual system that um, prepares young people and prepares communities to show up in that space? And then the second shorter question um, or response to the, um, the inequity in our equity uh, work that like stuck to my heart. Like we speak about equity and we serve and operate under a structure that don't speak what we're speaking. It's not mm. adjacent or in, a, in alignment with one, another, uh, um, with one another. And you pointed out the 80% of um, people of color on the, like the, um, the board, um, the 60% of people of color on the staff. And like how do we systematically, how do we how do we roll that out as a community of practice for other people to um, latch on to? Like, what's some tools that we can use to, um, I guess, start doing that in other communities? <laughs> wow, so uh, who wants to start? Um, I, I'll jump in and start, and then Luce can, Luce can, uh, Thanks, can, fill, can fill in. Um, we can do a lot more in terms of engaging young people. It's a, it's a, it's a real learning journey for us, but I can give a number of examples. Um, Really, the, the young people that have been engaged in our work locally here in our youth and young adult homelessness um, space have made a significant difference um, in the course of that work. I can point to a handful, a handful of policies that have been passed in our state, and some of them, I think, our state, I think, is considered one of the leaders across the, uh, the country in how we have innovated around youth and young adult homelessness. And I think a lot of it is attributable to our young people. We have supported an organization called Mockingbird Society um, that really works with kids that have experienced foster care as well as um, homelessness. And they um, train them to be both advocates for themselves, but advocates for uh, the broader work, the broader sector. And uh, the young people are just remarkable and are extremely effective. Uh, when they're down in Olympia, really um, advocating and championing some of the change that needs to happen. Um, so many of our progressive laws here in the state uh, have directly uh, to do with um, the engagement of, of our young people. We also um, are a dem um, we have a, a youth homelessness demonstration project where one of ten sites across the country that is federally funded, and um, there's a youth advisory group that's very central to every aspect of decision making uh, in that work. So we are finding ways to really engage young people because we know that the wisdom um, and the stories and the lived experiences that they bring um, are really powerful to, um, uh, to really identifying the right solutions to go about, uh, go about the work. But without question, we, uh, we need to do more uh, and we're continuing to uh, to evolve that work in, in some of the other areas that we're focusing on. Let me uh, let me interject, Shanice. Did you want? I'm, I'm going to ask her to ask her question or make her point, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. ask you all to finish because we're running out of time okay. with closing responses. So, Luce, I hate to hold you, but <laughs> we'll, we will get to it. And then, Shanice, I don't want you to lose your chance at the mic. So, please go ahead. Try it again. Hello, hello, yep, I'm there. Okay. So this entire discussion, um, especially Ms. Lapel's presentation, truly, truly resonated with me and my work, my heart, my passion, and the things that I do, um, especially as a youth advocate. You know, for us, Opportunities United, on the national level, we are really uh, developing this diverse youth-led organizing movement, um, truly targeting structural change, truly targeting, you know, institutional change, as well as, you know, my expertise on the ground and working and developing directly opportunity youth. Something that I struggle with is, I guess, on our journey towards this idea of 
targeted universalism, the whole concept of um, informing and really curating this universal goal. Um, for me, I feel like it's, it really often feels like the burden is placed on young people when we're in rooms around things like reshaping the narrative, um, building bridges. It often feels like the burden is on the young people who are trying to like lead these spaces and really work towards this change. And I guess my question is, well, first I wanna say, I believe and I agree that in order to change structures that the rules must change, but as young people and as young leaders, we're willing to take these risks. We're willing to be out here lending our voices. What advice would you give, you know, millennials and the generation behind us who are leading this work, who often feel like we're struggling with, you know, the burden of um, <laughs> reshaping the narrative and really working towards this concept of universalism, but specifically that universal goal. Great, thank you. So let's close. I mean, John did ap apologize for our generation mucking it all up, Shani, so, uh, but that's probably not enough. So let's, let's close with reflections on both of their reflections and questions, and then uh, we're gonna wrap this amazing conversation. Yeah, should I go? Yes, please, I'm okay. sorry. Okay, um, well, I really appreciate uh, your questions, and for me, um, we support a lot of youth movement and youth organizing and youth engagement as with, through Marguerite Casey Foundation. One of the things that I'm most proud of, oh, I just ended something in the proposition, oh, <laughs> <laughs> of which I'm, I'm most proud, <laughs> is to, uh, is this, the Shriver Youth Network that we are evolving. It's a network of young people from the 13 states where we fund where they get an opportunity for leadership. First of all, they're nominated to the foundation and they get a, a, an award. Uh, each, we, we select 20 young people a year and we're building that into a network. We evolve now to having one of the network members become, uh, have a one year term, maybe become two year term on our board of directors. So that's a way to develop mm -hmm. leadership and their role is to help train and, and engage the rest of the, of, the, uh, of the network members. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful leadership program because that's the other thing. We need to provide opportunities for leadership for young people. And, and I think we're doing a bit, we're a small foundation, but I think this is one of the things that, that I really, I really appreciate. And at lunch the other day, we both talked about how we both love LaShawn at yes. uh, OYU. He's in the back there, so I'm gonna help you for that. Um, uh, and thank you, OYU members. Yeah. Let's, any final words of wisdom, you guys, we are at time, but if there's a quick reaction to our two questions and comments, I'd love to hear from both of you. You know, I, I, probably the only other thing that I would add um, for any funders in the group is just this notion of proximity. Mm -hmm. I think um, oftentimes as funders, we are sitting in our offices sort of grappling with some of these complex issues, and um, one of the things that Jeff and I uh, enjoy most about our roles is the ability to get into the field and to really be with our young people. Um, they are just always a source of um, truth telling um, and have given us um, advice and wisdom that has really helped um, us pivot oftentimes or course correct uh, in the work that we're doing. So I want to just encourage that notion of proximity, getting as close to the work uh, and as close to the young people as you can, mm. and really hear firsthand their stories, their journeys, um, because it just looks very different uh, from that perspective than it does in a document or a report. And so I would just encourage uh, consideration of that. A uh, couple of quick thoughts. One, just uh, first of all, I appreciate what you had to say, the, the young woman who just spoke. Um, I think that's w what you describe is true of most uh, vulnerable and marginal communities. That is, we put a lot of um, stuff on them. And I appreciate what, what both of you are doing um, because I think part of the way you deal with that is give them resources to, for capacity. So we, I work in Richmond, for example, and uh, um, recently we actually hired a developer to come work with the community as the University of California to think about developing that community because uh, in a sense, yes, they know that they're facing gentrification. Yes, they know they're facing rising housing costs. Yes, they know the schools are not working. Uh, uh, but when the university 
was, was touted as the number one public university in the world, goes into that community, it hires a score of experts to help with all of the issues. And then it turns to the community and says, and we'll meet with you. Yeah. And so I, I, uh, California Endowment actually asked me to work with the community. And one of the first things I said was, okay, you gave some budget for my time, for my staff, that's great. We need a budget to hire a developer. And I said, developer? What do we need a developer for? We're talking about development. The community, and, and they love it. It's, it's actually been going on now for two or three years. For a developer to work with them in terms of their needs, in terms of translating what they're saying into that language has been really powerful. So that's one thing. The second thing, though, is that um, sometimes when we talk about target universalism or systems, you think you have to do everything, and you never can do everything. And so one of the reasons we get overwhelmed is we try to do everything. Uh, and instead, it's figuring out the two or three things that I call leverage points in a system that will populate the whole system. So the two or three critical things you can do that if you're successful on, they actually affect the rest of the system. And the last thing I'll say is that this is a life journey. So it's a both birth a curse and a blessing. Uh, and, um, you know, um, I could talk about both. I feel cursed and blessed by the work in some ways. Uh, but because it's a life journey, I would say two things, your network, so some peers, people to help each other, and to actually build some joy and relaxation into the work. Because, you know, sometimes it's work, 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 work. I mean, I've been accused of, by my friends, John, what you're doing is not sustainable. You know, you gotta get off the plane, you gotta stay home, you gotta whatever. And I'm thinking, you, you're right, after November, that's, I'm gonna do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is, is that people need time to exhale and they can't, it off for three to five years. So one of the things we did, it's not a small thing, uh, we actually rented out a movie theater in Oakland, Grand Lake Theater, some of you from Oakland might know, and we gave away tickets to the Black Panther movie. Um, and you know, those tickets went in like five minutes. Uh, but a lot of people said it was the first time they were in a collective space, it was probably at least half black, where people, people were celebrating and seeing themselves in a positive light. And most of them were young people. And so it worked so well that three weeks later we did the same thing with Wrinkle in Time. And now it was young women, teenage girls. So being in a place with about a thousand teenage <laughs> girls, and, and most of them are from quote unquote marginalized communities, but they were there to celebrate. So I would say build in, and maybe even in your grants, uh, say, you know, in Europe, you can actually get a, a prescription to go to a spa. Right? It's like, I'm tired, I need to take a break, I need to get a massage, my feet, you know. Uh, but anyway, you may not get the grant, you may not get them to do that, <laughs> but the point is, <laughs> pick, figure out some way of celebrating as you do the work, because it is a life journey, and also make sure you have the proper resources to support the work. Terrific. Uh, the world will look a lot better when we have more leaders like these three folks driving the conversation. Let's thank them all for their <laughs> Uh, we're going to transition with some spoken words, so if Carlin Newhouse can come on up and deliver, and we're glad you're here. We heard traffic was rough, so thank you for being here. Is this on? Yeah. Traffic is horrible, and I don't drive, so thanks to my mama for being the best person in the world. Hello, beautiful people. How y'all doing? Good. That was kind of sad. <laughs> like, y'all aren't excited about equity work or something. I said, how y'all doing? Word, word. My name's Carlin. I'm really excited to be here. I'm with You Speak Seattle and Arts Corps. I see Arts Corps people in the house. Hello. Um, I'm going to do a poem for you guys today um, that I'm really excited about. As a matter of fact, people were talking about breaking down systems and creating new worlds and equity and all of those beautiful things. And that's what the poem's about, so it's like works perfectly. Um, the only thing that I ask is when I perform, it's an interactive experience. So I am communicating with y'all, but you are also communicating with me. So when I perform, I feel more comfortable when I know that you enjoy the piece. So if you are silent, I think that you hate my poem. <laughs> when you respond, it makes me feel better and I have more energy to perform even better for you guys. Word? So oh. if anybody's ever been to a poetry performance before or not, I'm going to teach you how to engage. I heard people snapping today. Can we practice snapping? 
If you like anything I say, you can snap. You can stomp your feet. You can practice that. Can we practice stomping our feet together? Word. Did anybody eat some of that good food out there? You can moan like, mmm, like the food was bomb, mmm, amen, word. Anything you need to say, just the louder you are and the more you engage, the better I can perform. Word, is that good? Word, all right. So this poem is called The Sky is Falling. I actually wrote it after the election, so um, here we go. You remember Chicken Little? Yeah, you remember him? You remember when he warned the whole world the sky was falling? and they didn't believe him. Do you remember a few months ago when we warned everyone this white man would do us in and they did not believe us, the sky is falling. Can't you hear it? It sounds like Twitter feeds and police sirens, the sky is falling. Can't you hear it? It sounds like handcuffs clinking and white men laughing, can't you hear it? Our ancestors screaming, our children asking all the questions we cannot answer, the sky is falling, the country is falling, which is to say this country has always been falling. We have seen the breaking before. We have seen blood splattered church walls and gun chambers. But we know how to build beauty out of destruction, how to make home out of hollow wind. The sky is falling. But we have seen this before. Let the sky fall. Let us see all the stars. We will not waver. This howling wind will not be stronger than our hope. The world is ending. The sky is falling. Thank God. I'm tired of this earth. I'm ready to build a new one. The sky is falling. The world is ending, but it will begin again. We will build a new world from the ash, but let us not forget the fire. We will build mosaics out of the shards, but let us not forget the breaking. This cycle shall not continue. The world has ended so many times. We know a breaking, a falling, a bending. Yes, we have heard of the end, but what is the end of something if not the beginning? Let the sky fall. Let it give birth to something new, something bright and beautiful. Let every bullet be sucked into space. Let the sky fall. Let the new one be beautiful. Praise all that is new and holy. Praise all that lifts us. Let the new world hold us better than all the ones before. Let the sky fall. Let us prepare for the new beginning. Amen. Thank you. Worst part of my job, uh, we are is following that, uh, and I do it all the time. We're transitioning to breakouts, but uh, thank you for an amazing close, and thank you all for your attention. Onward. Thank you all.